Welcome to the 35th edition of DocFest Munich. Welcome to DocFest Munich at home, wherever you are watching us. My name is Isabel Fontou. I'm a member of the program team and of the writers team. And I'll have a talk today because we have a film in the program which I like very much. It's The Valley, called The Valley. It's a film by the Portuguese filmmaker Nuno Escudero. And it's part of the Best of Fest section in the festival. It was produced in France and in Italy. And I'm really happy that we'll have a talk now with the filmmaker Nuno Escudero and as well two of the protagonists, Elisabetta Panelli Tepsel and Simon Frankly Tepsel. But before we have the talk, I have to announce that this year, as every year, we have an audience award. And it's really important for us to know which film you, you liked most at the festival. So if you like this film, please go on the program site and you find the button where you can vote for the audience award. Okay, then I'm really, really happy to welcome the Portuguese director Nuno Escudiero, which received the Emergent International Filmmaker Award at the Hot Dogs Festival in Toronto for this film. And nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's quite an honor to be a dog fest. That I, I live in Bozen, that is quite close. So I, I go to fest every year for like four or five years now. Really? And so it's nice to be here. And I had a film there like four years ago in the student section. So oh, <laughs> now yeah. in the best of fest section, it's, I feel quite, it's quite an honor to... So it's great that, uh, that you come again now and are, are in the Vesa Fest section. <laughs> this is a great, good thing. And welcome Elisabetta and Simon as well. Hi, nice to oh, be here. Hi, glad to be here. So my first question is, wh where are you at the moment? Because we are in a special situation now in, with COVID-19. So it's really interesting to, to get to know where you, where you are. So maybe you know you, Tell us, this is your room where you are at the moment, and where this, are you? This is my room. I am lucky to have uh, such a big, spacious room. I'm in uh, Bolzano in Bozen, in the north of Italy. That is a region that is not so much affected, thankfully. And um, today, they lifted the 400 meters radius walk. So today is the first day that I can walk freely in the city after like one month and a half so things are getting better and did you go out already uh yeah, yeah. i went for a walk in the morning okay. a long long walk without restrictions that was good okay <laughs> and how about you you both elisabetta yes well uh simon and i are very lucky because we have two homes in this small village in uh, uh in southern france on the border uh, on the border between um, Italy and France. And uh, I am staying in our apartment in the village. Uh, I've been here for two months because at the beginning of, uh, at the beginning of uh, March, I was ill. And therefore I was, uh, you know, so I decided to, to isolate myself, to protect my husband because he works with, with somebody who is ill, so I just decided to do it. So I'm here, whereas Simon, you could, where are you? Whereas I'm uh, where some of the film, some of Nuno's film was made at the, at the place in the hills. So really I haven't noticed that much difference. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm as isolated as I was. I'm as isolated as this house uh, needed to be to shelter people while Nuno made his film, for example. And, uh, and it's very beautiful at the moment. I don't know how much you can see out of the window. We can. It's really beautiful. Uh -huh. There's an olive tree, I think. It is. It is a tree, and behind that there's a mountain. Uh, there's, a lot, there's, there's lots of other things as well, but, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a good place. Um, we can give the audience the exercise to find out how many times that olive tree appears in the film. Ah, yes. <laughs> That's true. I love one of these kind of uh, first correct answer, kind of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
and, and okay. how come you both? Yes, yeah, and I'm, I'm staying here at the moment. And in fact, I'm going back down to the village to work with the the, the handicapped guy I work with there in in about an hour's time. Okay, and how far it is to the village when you walk? Fifteen <laughs> minutes. Fifteen minutes. Twenty minutes. Okay. Okay. And how come both of you? Only four hundred meters. No, no. <laughs> but why? Why do you live in in, in, the, in the south of France? Why do we live in this beautiful village? How come? Uh, well, that's kind of a long story. We live. I mean, we live here partly because of its beauty, partly because it kind of still has an element of freedom, rather less in the current circumstances than normal. But because it's so kind of, kind of hard to get to. And it's a bit of a, you know, you can only come here when you come here. There's nowhere else. Uh, it doesn't get touched very much. We, can, we find that we're quite free to live as we wish. We, uh, we can live to a certain extent outside the system. We are semi-self-sufficient, et cetera. And so, 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 so we chose it for that reason, partly. Partly because there's some great people here as well. Okay, and what, was this the reason, Nuno, why you chose this place for your film? Maybe is this, are there special people living in Saor or in the Valley of Roya? Or how, how, did, you, how did you find these people to, for your film? Or how did you, did you find the seat? Special, special people is the way to say it. It's like it's a very special place and it's, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's quite impressive. And that's exactly what brought me there was uh, what the people were doing. Because I... I was living in northern Finland and then I moved uh, here to Bolzano and I was living both times close to borders and then I, at some point what I realized is that these borders were, were closed, were shut down and they were being controlled by the police and so on and as I started doing a little bit of research I found out that people living next to these borders were helping refugees trying to cross them and so on and uh, for example here in Bolzano it was quite a big issue because People didn't really want to be filmed or didn't really want to talk about what they were doing because it was quite risky, as we see then in, in Roya, happened the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, uh, what happened that was quite uh, fascinating is that I heard of this place of Roya where things were going on exactly the same way as they were, uh, as they were uh, elsewhere. But the difference was that the people were actually trying to create a discussion about it, trying to make it public and say, look, this is what is happening, it's too much on our shoulders, and we are forced to act in this certain way. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that, by contrast to what was happening in the other places that I knew, mm -hmm. I really wanted to, to come here and to try to understand what does it mean to, to actually take up this responsibility and to, to actually make it public and to, to enter kind of a, an open battle with the French state and uh, like the whole migration policy and how their, uh, their lives actually speak for, uh, for what a lot of people throughout Europe are doing and how can we kind of uh, tell the story of, of a much bigger movement yes. like that is kind of mm -hmm. all that we can see through Roya but mm -hmm. it, that touches every city in Europe nowadays. It touches, but I think the, the good thing about the people in Roya is that they are willing to have the, the public um, knowing what they are doing and having an impact in this way. And so this was maybe this was a good de decision to go there to, with your camera and make your film there. But of Not course, it's the a beginning. big issue. Yeah, Not in the beginning, at the very beginning, when, uh, when we were, well, for me, it was a question of when I first uh, was faced with the situation, when we saw the first migrants arrive, it was always a choice between looking at it and not looking at it. It was either becoming aware of what was happening or just closing your eyes. So it was impossible for us to do it differently. So we had no choice. That's the first thing I'd like to say. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but at the very beginning, uh, we, Sam and I decided not to really to give any interviews, not to meet the press with our first migrants, Filmon and Seare, we're in Germany right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, Filmon in, uh, has just uh, got a diploma, he speaks German, level B2 already, oh, he's been there for two years and he's a lovely guy and Seara is doing a lot, very well as well. Anyway, when we started, when we had them and they were the first people, uh, we were scared for them. We didn't want anybody to know, not for us, but for them, 
We want them to have a safe journey wherever they wanted to go. Yes. They stayed with us for 20 days. The village was surrounded by the police. We couldn't take them to Nice. So they had to walk away from the village along the railway tracks. They were stopped in a nearby village by the army and sent back to Italy. But luckily they uh, were able to escape and they, you know, to escape, to leave Italy again. And now they're safely in Germany. Mm -hmm. But just to tell you, at the beginning, we didn't want to talk about it. But then we realized that every time we talked about it, something would move. First of all, we got money because people started sending money to our association that we needed to feed migrants of course. at the border. Mm -hmm. But then also, you know, people were actually talking about us. And that's why, and afterwards we actually won a few battles with mm -hmm. the French government. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty good. So Thank you, Nuno as well, and his film. So at what, what moment did you arrive then, Nuno? How, um, in what period was it then? How many? Was it at the, the beginning or was it really well in the middle of everything? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of funny because it's, it's a really long process and it kept on changing. So I arrived the first time we went there was during the, the trial of Cedric. So it was the, the peak of mediatization, whereas when people were really knowing about what was going on and there were a lot of journalists, a lot of people coming from all over the world to sing and talk about it. And we filmed a little bit, but actually our film starts a bit afterwards when uh, all the journals, you know, and they made this big case of, of Cedric. And then actually the people of Roya were a bit, uh, let's say, not abandoned, but uh, it started changing. And that's when things started to get interesting because uh, it was the moment where they actually started winning battles against the French government. Mm -hmm. It was the moment where they were actually telling the French government, look, what you're doing is illegal. It, I mean, you, you are telling us that we are doing illegal things, but in fact, it's you who are doing illegal things. And they were, the moment that they started changing things and really doing things differently, the moment that they created a protocol to actually allow refugees to, let's say not to cross the border, but to once they arrived to Cedric's house or to the valley, that they could actually move, in, move to, to Nice and to ask for asylum. And uh, during these victories, even though there were really good journalists still covering it and everything, but actually it, uh, the fight cha changed a lot. And then the film follows actually, actually more the period where the media had left again and where there was not coverage anymore. Well, this is interesting because one of the first scenes in the film is with the Eritrean family, and which is at your house, Elisabetta, and you teach them to um, ask for asylum in France and then you accompany them to the police and you're really hopeful that they will g get I was, I, I was sure I was sure that we would you know we would get through and it was a really shocking moment I think you can see that you know I had uh, Michele in my arms and I even asked him to give a flower to the policeman Mm -hmm. And I felt like an idiot afterwards. I felt like an idiot. I felt worse than that. Mm -hmm. I felt horrible. It was, a, it was a shocking moment when they had to, you know, get into that uh, van, police van, and uh, they were driven to Menton uh, at the police de la frontière, la PAF. Huh? So that was horrible. Yeah. So, and, and in the film, you, 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 you tell in the film that you're really you're really astonished that it doesn't work and in the in the while the film is is um, proceeding you the, the the inhabitants of the valley discover that it's that they are right that it's the right of the refugees once they are on, on french ground that they have the right to apply for asylum and when i watched the film at the first moment i think maybe you didn't know it in at this period maybe you know you knew it only later on already yeah. We were really in the process uh, of uh, of getting to, to, of learning the procedure. We were at the very beginning. We had all the assurances the first time we tried to cross the border or, or take him to Nice to this family to Nice. We were pretty sure we were going to do it because we had you know started the procedure. We had lawyers following us, mm -hmm. but uh, but it didn't work that time. It worked a couple of weeks later oh, okay. when we had an appeal and uh, so we won the appeal and were, they were able to to, to to actually finally as you see in the film yeah that was the crucial moment 
Okay, and this, uh, this is really interesting to see that it really can work when the civilian disobedience can work and that it's not only always the police who, is, who has the right, does the right things, but you have to really to react and to, yeah. to do the things you would yourself, you for yourself think that are yeah. the right ones. So that's why, sorry. So, so I'll, I'll just let me say, interestingly, part of our learning process was exactly that. It was an enormous expansion of what was the right thing to do or the, the most convenient or the easiest, but anyway, to keep people out of danger as much as possible. And that was underlined in this case by the fact that that particular family was allowed to apply for asylum. They stayed in accommodation in Nice whilst that was processed. But before the decision came through on that right to asylum, they ran. And I think they did very well to run. They were intelligent enough to see that there was no logic. There was certainly no form of justice. They'd been through absolute hell before they arrived with us. And we, we only heard half the stories and they would, they would make you shake. Uh, and so they decided quite rationally that before the police turned up at their door and said, your right to asylum has been denied, they would go. And they went and they're still free. And they're in Germany as well. Okay. So you're still in contact with the Absolutely people? With everybody. With every single migrant we've had at home. Okay. We, thanks to Facebook, for example, a messenger. <laughs> okay. Yeah, at least one good thing about it. <laughs> And Nuno, how long, how long did, was your shooting period? I think you came for several times now. Or how did you shoot? I think in total I might have been there, not always shooting, but like in total around 10 times. And we started in September 2016. And uh, that was the first shoot. And the last shoot was December 2018. So it was like a period of two years. Oh, okay. okay. And how long did you work in the editing room for this film? It's hard to, <laughs> to calculate, but we started around November 2018 with, with breaks and everything, and we ended, we had uh, the rough cut by, I think, April 2019, no, 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 March 2019, so about one year ago. So it was also like four months, five months. Not too long. We worked hard and well. Four months only. So this is not yeah. long for a 90 minutes documentary. <laughs> yeah. It's not long. It's, uh, it's good. I mean, also we didn't have so many resources. We were, it was good for a first film and it was a long battle also to get the film financed. Yes. As you can imagine in 2019, 2020, a refugee story, it's not the easiest thing to fund. Mm -hmm. But uh, we ended up having like great partners like Public Sena and like Arte. And uh, in the end, we, we made it in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it arrived quite um, quite far. And this thing and it's still traveling now. It's on a break, yeah. and, uh, except for the online. But, but it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it was quite a big challenge. Uh, I mean, the film was ended up being much bigger and much more ambitious than the, the conditions we had to do it. And that's, that was good. Because being uh, there um, editing, Nicolas shooting, uh, David doing sound, our producers in France in Italy, everyone was believing in it, everyone was giving 150%. And okay. It was uh, quite a big effort. To, to but it, it. it was worth doing it, I think, because it's an important film and it, it, it's really good that it's finished now and that it has its audience now. And my last question is now to for, for Simon and Elisabetta. How are things now in, in the valley? Are there still refugees coming at the moment? Or is it is it a period that is gone now? Or how is it? it it's a... Elisabetta? No, no, go ahead. I was going to say, it's a period that's gone. And it's gone largely because the doors have been closed much more firmly than they ever were before. Uh, the migrants are not getting to us. However, as we know from, for example, the situation in Syria and the situation in Yemen over the last 18 months, nothing's improved. Migrants are still moving in massive numbers. 
And so a lot of those migrants are not here because they're dead. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's a European problem, you might say. So I have some news from um, um, every week. Uh, we have a Skype meeting with uh, lots of people who are involved, I would say activists who are involved with the migrant situation from um, uh, the northern border uh, and uh, Besançon and uh, from Ventimiglia, et cetera, et cetera. So I have a few, some information. There, are, uh, there is a limited number of migrants right now in Ventimiglia. Of course, they're isolated, they're confined like everybody else in the Red Cross uh, the, um, uh, center, okay? So that's where they are right now. And so uh, they cannot move. Every once in a while, a bus will come and uh, will take them down to an official center, especially if they ask for asylum in Italy. Uh, for example, the, uh, the 75 people last week were taken to Umbria, to a special center. Uh, every once in a while, uh, unaccompanied minors will find shelter somewhere else as well. But everything is really slow, because you can imagine. Uh, yes. For example, I know that in Savona, the people who work uh, for the migrants, they're all homesick with coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And uh, so just to give you an example, the situation is really blocked right now. Yes. Um, the French police is not sending anybody back anymore, but that's because not very many migrants are trying to cross the border. Mm -hmm. There are very few, and we have we don't have the data. Uh, we cannot get enough information. So the situation is really on standby everywhere. Okay, so I understand. Yeah, to add that there is a problem that uh, throughout Europe, and that's what activists are saying, is that the fact that most activists said to move away, so we cannot know exactly what is going on because most people are actually in quarantine. So we don't know what rights are being violated right now, how the state that suddenly gotten much stronger is actually treating people's rights and uh, what is actually happening. Because the eyes that were throughout all the hot zones, throughout all the borders of, uh, of Europe, they are not there anymore. No. And that's uh, worrisome. Yeah, thank you for reminding me that there is one thing uh, which is also paramount to say is that uh, uh, we're not feeding migrants anymore. We can't. We cannot drive down uh, and feed migrants. When I say we, I'm not talking about Sam and I in particular. We're talking about, for example, Keshania, which is a German or an international association that was in, uh, that was in Northern France before, in Calais, and now is here. And every day they were feeding between 200 and 300 migrants. Uh, during the summer, in the past years, we, they fed up to 900 migrants in a day. So they cannot go there anymore. They have no right uh, to help and also to collect information from the migrants who, have, who, who were sent back from France because they have been, you know, that was an important job they were doing, uh, trying to, um, to bear witness to the treatment of migrants from the French police especially. So this is one, yeah. this is because of the situation nowadays. Yeah. Things are getting more difficult, and so and things are getting more maybe or not less seen than it would be yeah. good for these the situation mm -hmm. of the migrants. Yes, so we I think we have to stop our talk now, but I think thank you very very much. I wish you all the best. Stay healthy, and thank I hope you. Um, we will go back to a normal um, everyday life. Yeah, one day. Uh and if I can just interrupt for a moment, Isabel, let's not hope that. It's normal that God is here in the first place. Let's not go not go back to normal. Okay. Eh? Okay. <laughs> and we'll have to see another film from you, Nuno, in your next film. Please. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's take it one step at a time. But for sure it will be a film uh, again so that we reflect a little bit about this normal that we don't want to be back. Exactly. Yes. I know it's one minute. Bye, Nuno. <laughs> Thank you as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And um, dear audience, please vote for the, the audience award if you like this film. If you didn't see, that, see it already, so come on, you can go and watch it. It's really, really a beautiful and important film. 
and hope to see you soon at DocFest at home 2020. Bye-bye.